This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Jungle Deep. The podcast that explores the tropical lifestyle. Hello and welcome to the podcast, Jungle Deep. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We are on safari and I am here with you to learn, to have fun, and to explore the jungle. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We have a wonderful episode for you this time about tigers. And even better, we have the perfect holiday gift for you to give to someone you care for or to get for yourself. The beautiful new book written by our guest authors on today's show. It's called Tigers Forever. This gorgeous new book is a must-have for any lover of nature. Don't hesitate to order a copy for yourself to read during those quiet moments after the holidays. One reason this book is so special is because tigers are so special. But another reason is that this book was written by nature and science writer Sharon Guinup. The wonderful photos for Tigers Forever was taken by famous National Geographic photographer Steve Winter. I have both of them on the show for you today to tell us about their new book and about their experiences with tigers. In recent weeks, an amazing and unlikely photo has been circulating in the media. You surely have seen it. It shows a wild mountain lion standing in front of the iconic Hollywood sign. That photo was one of the many clever photos taken by Steve Winter. Let's not waste a moment getting to our interview with Sharon Guinup and Steve Winter. Well, I am so pleased today to be able to talk to Sharon Guinup and Steve Winter. These pair have written a book about tigers called tigers forever it's a brand new beautiful gorgeous book and we get to talk to both sharon and steve about the production now steve is a, was a photojournalist doing the pictures for this and sharon i believe did all the writing on this book do i have this right say hello are you guys there Yes, yeah. we're here. And yes, you do have it right, Ken. Very good. Well, you, you both have amazing careers. You've done a lot of great stuff in the world of conservation. You've been involved in some amazing projects. Uh, you're, you're at the pinnacle of your careers. You must be. You're, you're heroes to a lot of us because you're, you're providing the kind of information and the details that we love to hear about and the information we need to have about what's happening to wildlife around the world. You two are in the thick of it. And I'm, I can hardly wait to hear about this, this new book. But before we do that, give our audience a, ideas to each of you. Sharon, you go first. Tell us a little bit about your past experience, the projects you've been involved in. I started out as a photographer, but I changed careers, you know, midway and, you know, studied science, health and environmental reporting at New York University. Um, so I guess that was 14 years ago now and, and decided to focus on wildlife issues, environmental issues, and environmental health issues. I write a great deal on wildlife conservation and have written a great deal on cats for many publications, and this is my first book. And what are some of the topics you've covered in the past? I've written on, you know, everything from, you know, the discovery of the SARS virus in bats. Steve and I did a cover story for Smithsonian Magazine on jaguars a couple years back. I've written on sharks and pangolins and climate change, energy issues. And where have some of these things appeared? Some of the publications? I've written for the New York Times Syndicate, Smithsonian, Scientific American, Audubon Magazine, the Boston Globe, many other publications as well. Yeah, well, I, I think that pretty well gives that picture. And Steve, you're a fantastic photographer, wildlife photographer. Tell us a little bit about your past projects and where your work has appeared. I've worked at National Geographic uh, Magazine for uh, over 20 years as a photographer. I primarily do environmental stories, but I started my career as a photojournalist and then switched gears 
I think back in about 92 or something like that, I'm also director of media for the world's largest big cat organization, and that is Panthera, an organization that was started with by Dr. Alan Rabinowitz with one of his main funders, Tom Kaplan. And it's got the best big cat scientists in the world in it. It's kind of funny because I really didn't switch gears because I worked with these people on National Geographic stories my whole career. And so now I do both things. They use my pictures to help uh, raise awareness for big cat issues. I uh, still shoot for National Geographic because that's what I'm good at. And I have uh, a cougar story coming out on the 15th in just uh, about a week. And our Tigers Forever book comes out November 12th from National Geographic Books. And it is my first book. So, really? So, so both of us, we're lucky we got to do it together, and uh, we hope to do many more. It's a gorgeous book. The pictures, the cover, I just love the cover. Yeah, I'm often asked what my favorite animal is, and I cannot answer that question. I love so many. I don't have a favorite, but I, if you ask me what I consider the most beautiful animal is, I, I would probably say the tiger. I'm just in awe of tigers, and I'm sure a lot of people are. So tell us, how did you guys get into this particular book? How did Tigers Forever uh, come about? Well, that's an interesting thing. It came about because we were thinking about a book, and it was Sharon's idea to take a couple of other stories I had done that included tigers and put them together in one volume. And it was kind of anchored, not kind of, but it was anchored by the fact that I did the last National Geographic magazine tiger story. But it all started on a trip with Dr. Alan Rabinowitz to create the world's largest tiger reserve in Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. And we went into what was called the Valley of Death, and that was the name of the story, and created that. Then the next story was on Kaziranga National Park in uh, northeastern India, which I like to call a historic landscape because tigers live with rhinos and elephants and many species of, of deer and water buffalo. And it's got the highest density of tigers and highest population of elephants and buffalo. So instead of like other tiger reserves in India, they have a lot of animals they used to live with that don't exist in most of those landscapes any longer. And then go in and then pretty much dedicate many months of work into one park, which was then the uh, main natural history stuff with tigers, because you can see tigers in India. But at the same time, we went to Sumatra, because that subspecies was in trouble with all the palm oil. And then to go to an area in Thailand that is the most largest success story of having tigers almost disappear and then have them brought back and be very successful and put all that together. Well, now what about the book, Tigers Forever? Really? That's a pretty optimistic title, isn't it? How did you decide on that title? Actually, that title is the title of the tiger program that Panthera runs. And because 10% of the proceeds of this book goes to Panthera, we decided to name it after their tiger program. I see. I see. And, uh -huh. you know, there's another important aspect of it. When I first, Alan Rabinowitz has been a friend of mine for years since I did the first Jaguar story for National Geographic and worked with him on that. And he, again, was working with a funder that literally said, if you ran a business like you run conservation, you'd be out of business in a year. We need to change how we do things because it's failing, uh, specifically tigers, because this one funder loves tigers. They both created a new type of conservation program, which has a goal, which has accountability and a goal of raising tiger numbers in specific landscapes by 50% over 10 years. And it's like no projects have this. It's like if you want to save tigers, well, you need to have a baseline, but then you need to have a goal. What are you going to do? And work with the best minds from Dr. George Schaller, who's vice president of Panthera and did the first mm -hmm. tiger project back in 60 and wrote the book Deer and Tiger in 62 and get everybody's ideas, try to get different organizations to work together instead of separate because raising money for tigers is actually big business and you have a businessman that looks at it and goes obviously this is not working 
we need to find a different way to save tigers. And I was totally impressed, took the idea to geographic, and it was kind of the cornerstone of, of what I looked at in conservation programs. And then later on, I actually started working there. Well, now, Steve, if I'm understanding you, you're saying the thing that needed to be done differently was the creation of goals and accountability right. toward, towards working towards those goals. Is that right? Exactly. I, I look okay. at a UN report that was done in 2006, and it talked about the many millions of dollars spent on tigers in the last decade. Tiger numbers plummeted during that decade. So like anything, if you have enough money and supposedly the best minds, if you put all that together and it doesn't work, you've got a major problem and you need to figure out what that problem is. And that's what Alan and Rabinowitz and Michael Klein did when they created Tigers Forever. To me, one of the cornerstones was the fact that the Save the Tiger program actually said, we're going to stop what we're doing and we are going to have Panther administer this because this is the only project we've ever seen that has gotten real tangible results. Michael Klein is an entrepreneur who partnered with Alan Rabinowitz to create Tigers Forever. He's created a string of companies that have all changed the paradigm of how a business was done. The first of those was Fandango, which you know sells movie tickets online, but it was the first one to do so. I think he took that very forward-thinking business acumen and applied it to conservation. And you know that's a really interesting hybrid of disciplines. And I think that is why Panthera is achieving the results they are. Well, now, Sharon, have you met a tiger? Yes, I have. And Steve, I'd say safe to say you've met a tiger or two. <laughs> I've run so I've, I've, I've I'm gonna, away from a few of them, but <laughs> and uh, well, spent spent a lot of time on the ground, uh, getting to know a certain family of tigers in Central India. Well, tell our audience what is a tiger like. A tiger is one of the most confident beings I've ever been around. When you talk about king of the jungle, that's what they are. They don't have any predators. They are one of the most... Well, the first time I saw a tiger, you have this this feeling that comes across your body that you've never seen such a strong, powerful being. And those eyes uh, staring you in the face. I mean, I've been face to face with most all big cats in the world and was most scared to death by a jaguar experience I had when I first started Big Cats. But yeah, I'll, I'll never forget the first tiger that I ever saw. And uh, they're just incredibly beautiful creatures. It's just, you know, uh, everything came together knowing that they were in a dire situation and someone needed to figure out a new way to save them because it wasn't working. And that's what propelled me into proposing the last tiger story for National Geographic, and hence uh, putting together this book. I think it's interesting you describe tigers as being confident, the most confident creature you've come across. You know, I think that's probably really true. Of course, they have a lot to feel confident about. <laughs> They're so big and powerful and strong, and uh, I, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that when a tiger purrs, he shakes the room. <laughs> I th Those vibrations just go right through your body, don't they? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. You can you you can feel it. It's a visceral feeling when you're close to them, and you are, have a natural fear, yeah. but a natural respect. Yes, yes, you certainly should. You certainly should. You are listening to Jungle Deep. Deep. Spanning the planet. Spanning the planet. You've landed at the pet entertainment center of the universe. Alert the paparazzi. This is Pet Life Radio, the ultimate animal adventure. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> You've been working with tigers for quite a while. How about you, Sharon? How did this, your concern about, I mean, you've talked about so many subjects. You've looked into so many things. How did your concern about ti tigers develop? Was it through knowing Steve or other ways? Yes, actually, I joined Steve on assignment in Kaziranga National Park, which is in Assam in northeast India. I was doing 
a story on Kaziranga as well. And he had been there, you know, for months. So I got an assignment to be able to join him and spend some time with him. Kaziranga has head high grass. It's packed full of animals. And it was, you know, the first time I glimpsed a tiger. And, you know, as Steve, you know, described it, the first time you see a tiger is a really powerful experience. They have an incredibly strong presence. Part of that story was about tigers in India and particularly tigers in Kaziranga. I went on from there to write many stories about cats, other stories about tigers. And then Steve and I decided to collaborate on this book. And I did you know, far more research for this book. Now, how long did this book take to produce? Pretty much from December 1st till end April. the end of April. So it was very quick. You know, I gathered, uh, Steve, you in particular, I would imagine, already had photographs that you'd taken earlier that you planned to use in this. Yeah, no, it, it was about uh, about 10 years worth of Whoa. <laughs> work on tigers. Uh, you know, but like the first part was from Myanmar. It was the creation of a tiger reserve. But for me, that story was an education in how local people uh, use products from the jungle how the area had been taken over by gold miners. And I learned that you you can't eat the prey of a predator and expect that predator to flourish. And 50,000 people were coming and killing all the tiger's food. And so to me, it was a learning experience. I never saw a tiger, though it was right in front of me many times. And you sit there and watch a giant tiger pub mark in the sand fill up with water, you know it's right in front of you. So that was a great educational experience for me, and it was a really good story, and then moved on from there. Well, that's a good segue to talking about an overview of what's going on with the tigers. What is the situation regarding tigers in the world today? Can you give us kind of the big picture? What's going on with the tigers? Most people don't realize that there's only 3,200 tigers left in the wild, and of those 3,200 tigers... That's split amongst five subspecies, and they're scattered in small pockets across 12 countries in Asia. So that's not very many. And, you know, there's a a number of major threats facing them. Habitat loss is huge. Asia is an extremely populated landscape. And, you know, there's many people fighting for both land and the same resources that tigers need. Not only habitat, but those people hunt the same food that the tiger eats. On top of that, there's really intense poaching pressure, and that's a major issue. The international wildlife trade is not a small thing. Many people picture a poor local villager killing a tiger, he's broke. The real story is that the same international crime syndicates that traffic Humans, guns, and drugs also are the same people trafficking wildlife. And most of of the tigers that are poached and trafficked are headed for China. And they're headed there because their bones are used for tiger bone wine. And there's a growing high-end market in tiger skin furniture in China. And China's local and national laws are promoting a growing demand for tigers. Is there any way to determine... What percentage of tiger loss is due to habitat loss and what percentage is due to the poaching? Habitat loss is considered to be the number one threat. They're running out of places to live. That said, you know, there's these postage stamps of habitat left that may or may not have food in them. Reserves can also be, you know, sitting ducks, you know, for tigers because poachers know where to look for them. (laughs) Right, right. Well, you know, I've heard it often said recently that uh, we're losing about two rhinos a day. But I've heard 6,000, about 6,000 rhinos left in the world. And we're losing about 50 elephants a day. They say one every 15 minutes. Wow. Do you know how many tigers we're losing a day? To tell you the truth, I, I don't think anyone knows. I mean, the tiger is a, except for reserves where the populations are well known, and managed by the guards, that the guards know exactly where these tigers are. There's a situation that, you know, unless they're in a reserve, they are an unknown entity. They weren't even counted until three years ago in India. They didn't exist. If they weren't in a reserve, they didn't exist. Of course, they did exist, so 
they didn't exist on paper. Right. So, it, you know, if nobody's monitoring or they, if they haven't counted them, then who knows when they're gone. So what India has done now is what most conservationists have done to get surveys of the amount of animals is uh, use camera trapping. Right. And so that's being started in India to get a baseline of data because when I first started this, uh, the Indians used pug marks and they had a number of how many tigers there were. And all of a sudden, that number dropped by two thirds. Well, guess what? It, that, that number probably didn't exist for 30 years, but they were using bad science to come to that. So now they're figuring out by camera trapping and within, you know, they have a, an idea now. But I don't think they even know how many tigers exist out of reserves. The one number that they are able to come up with each year in India is they, of the tigers that they are counting, the ones that they, you know, are able to count within reserves, they do come up with a, a yearly death toll in India. You know, that, that fluctuates. Well, Steve brings up a good point about the fact that because they're so elusive, I mean, it's a lot harder to know how many cats you've got in an area. Your rhinos and your elephants aren't exactly elusive. They're a little easier to count, I think, than uh, the cats would be. So, Well, not only that, a lot of those are managed reserves also, and they know when they lose those rhinos because they have people on the ground that they know all the specific individuals, and that's the same for the tiger reserves. However, I think animals that live in jungles are a lot harder to count and track. Yes, I would think so. And those camera traps are probably a really great tool. And it's a fairly new technology that they're using that's really helping us to define the situation and the problem better now than ever before, huh? Well, a hundred percent, especially with digital camera traps, because I remember asking one of the top tiger scientists in the past uh, using film, and they had a failure rate of about 60 percent. Well, how can you get a good number on the amount of animals you have if your failure rate is 60 percent because you're working in some of the most extreme conditions on the planet? with a intense monsoon so film sticks together and all this and then the first digital camera traps had a lag time so by the time the animal walked by you might get its tail or i still have one of those cameras yeah so you know, <laughs> now they want you know capture recapture both sides of the animal because tiger stripes are like a fingerprint so you can id specific individuals and what we need to do is get a baseline of data, a correct number to then build upon from there. I'd like to talk a little bit about the way Steve gets these pictures. Steve sets up a camera trap, which consists of a receiver and a transmitter. He sets it up on a place that scientists or park guards tell him that, you know, tigers should be walking those trails. They've seen scratch marks or, you know, marking spots. So he sets up a camera in a waterproof box with a couple of flashes, all in waterproof boxes, all wired together. When something breaks the infrared beam between the transmitter and the receiver, the camera fires a number of times. And one thing that Steve really tries to do is to look the animals in the eye. He sets the cameras low. You know, as humans shooting from, you know, an elephant or shooting from a Jeep, which is usually what you do when you're photographing dangerous animals, you're shooting above, you're shooting down at them. You're not looking them in the eye. And some of Steve's most powerful tiger images, you're looking these tigers right in the eye. And um, it really gives them the power and majesty that they deserve. I think that's an excellent point, Sharon. I'm glad you you described that to us. Yeah, that's my personal experience. Well, I think one of the most important things is, is that camera traps give you an intimate portrait. The camera car that I had National Geographic develop got right up to the, the Tigers also. We actually, you know, it was a kind of a model car, and we were able to place a DSLR camera on it that would take photographs remotely. And I always said the only way I'd get that close to a tiger if I was in its mouth. And uh, that's true, because you don't get these images, and we need to find new ways to photograph and film these animals 
Um, I, I got I got a ba- I got to hold you up, Steve, for a moment. It, you're describing putting a camera on like a little radio control car. Is that what you're I, saying? I would love to, that, that, I would love Steve to start this over. I was trying to motion to him, Steve. What you need to say here no, okay. is you need to say that we placed a camera on a large remote control car that's just a bigger version of the remote control car a kid would use right. as a yeah, toy. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get and, clarity and drives on. Drives right up to a tiger. You got to really explain well, this because it's yeah, really- yeah it's, it's, well. Well, it's a little surprising, frankly, and it's a tad amusing, and it's uh, it's wonderful. I just have funny pictures of, of these wild cats, these carnivores, going after a, a model car after it's stolen a couple of pictures. I would think they might might consider that quite a cat toy and uh, yeah, and, and do a little damage to that to that car too. But it is interesting the technology we're using. I mean, it well, used they, to be they, you and your camera out in the field, but now we got we got camera traps and we've got uh, electric cars, model cars with cameras on them, and we've got drones. There's been a lot of talk about flying drones now that are helping to um, find animals and count them and and survey the landscape and keep an eye on what's going on in the jungles and stuff it's all amazing and wonderful stuff well since cash can be empowering i'm going to ask each of you what you would do if you could get an open check for any sum of money you needed to make a difference here how would you spend that money what would you do steve brought up a really important point one of the most important aspects to saving tigers is having boots on the ground There's been lots and lots of tiger research. There's still many things that we don't know about tiger natural history and and where they go. All of that's key. But protection is really, really important. So I would certainly spend a a good chunk on training incredible military-style protection forces for parks that have thriving tiger populations. Personally, I, I think there's probably a real growth industry in the years and decades ahead in wildlife protection forces. I, I got to believe there's going to be and should be because, as you say, it's what's so badly needed. We need some people out there with some really good experience, military type experience, and and good hardware to help police these areas of wild kingdom. Consistency is of the utmost importance, and if we do want these animals there and these areas protected, then we need to look at it as uh, these areas need a police force just like our towns and cities do. Well, Steve, it sounds like you're endorsing Sharon's idea about putting that money into manpower for policing these areas. 100%. I can't think. The scientists are doing great work. The ones in Thailand when I was there were doing the first female tiger study ever. Now, hold it. This is 2011, and we're doing the first female tiger study ever. I found that a bit hard to believe, but you know what they're doing now? They're studying collaring, putting uh, GPS sat collars on tigers on the edge of the park because no one knows, just like you asked about how many tigers are lost and the numbers, what happens to the tigers that disperse. That's what young female and male tigers do. They have to go off to find their own area. If the landscape's not large enough for them to stay within the protected area, they'll venture out. Uh, They may find a pocket of forest that they can hide in and hunt properly if there's enough prey there. But no one knows, you know, whether they're dead or alive. I mean, they're off the charts then. They're not counted by camera traps. Nobody's monitoring them. And that's another great study. So two things. Continued scientific study, but number one is protection. Well, Sharon and Steve, this has been really interesting. You've really given us some insights into understanding the tiger picture and what's going on with it. I want to ask you where people can go to learn more about tigers and how maybe they can be a part of the solution. They can certainly go to Panthera's website, which is panthera.org, I believe. Yes, panthera.org. You can go to ngm.com, which is National Geographic Magazine, and uh, there's a tiger section there also. And the Big Cats Initiative that is uh, that Panthera and National Geographic are working together on. Those are two the two organizations I work with, the scientific brains and the know-how and the funds to save tigers and National Geographic is like no other organization on the face of the earth. We're all about information and giving people a reason to care. So both of those areas are close to our hearts and and go to the book. We're going to have a book site coming out tomorrow. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's your book site? 
TigersForeverBook.com. There yeah, you TigersForeverBook.com. I mean, Sharon wrote 45,000 words, interviewed 68 people, and we have 12 profiles of some of the best tiger people in the world on there also. So. Oh, that's amazing. That sounds yeah. great. Well, what great references. Uh, how about for you yourselves individually? If people want to follow you and learn a little more about your good work, how can they do that? I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, and you know I have my own website as well. That's SharonGuineup.com. Also, Steve and I will be producing content for the next six months for National Geographic's new cat blog. And we'll both be blogging, writing stories, and producing videos on tigers for that blog. And my, my, my website is stevewinterphoto.com. Very good. And well, of course, uh, listeners will have all those links on our show notes page for this episode, as well as uh, information on how to get a copy of the new book, Tigers Forever. We'll have links there, too, so that you can get access to that, that beautiful new book. I want to thank the two of you for being on the Jungle Deep show and sharing your time with us and telling us about this project and and other things that you've done, too. It's been a real honor to be able to talk to the two of you, and thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, and and I hope both the book and and your efforts here, uh, as well as ours, will help make people aware of the fact that we need to work harder to save tigers. We'll all keep doing it, won't we? We will. (laughs) <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you again. Bye bye now. All right. Bye bye. This has been the Jungle Deep Podcast. You will find on our Jungle Deep website the show notes page for this episode, number 28. Be sure to pay a visit because I have for you there some of Steve Winter's beautiful photographs, some of the best you will ever see of tigers, and associated website addresses and links. The music today was. For our opening, Jericana Mix by Ken Jones with Apple Loops, a segment of Jingle Bells by the Blue Hawaiians, and our closing music is by Don Tiki called Jungle Julie. Support these wonderful artists by purchasing their music. Again, let me invite you to visit and like our Facebook page. It is maintained with all of the -the up-to-the-minute news and announcements and great photos. Simply search on Facebook for Jungle Deep Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Jones. Well, the show's over for today, so it's time to refill my Mai Tai, mount my elephant, and head back into the jungle. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.